Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to those joining us in the US. Um, good evening to those joining us from Pakistan and the region. Um, welcome to the Brookings Institution. Thanks for, for joining us. Uh, we will be discussing today Pakistan's elections and what is next for the country. Um, we have a great panel with us, and I'll introduce them in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but first, I want to give a short brief uh, on, on this current moment and what has turned into uh, a remarkable election. Um, so Pakistan's general and provincial assembly elections uh, were held last Thursday, February 8th, uh, several months after they were constitutionally due. They were due last fall. More than 61 million voters showed up at the polls despite internet and cell phone services being shut off that day. Um, candidates backed by former Prime Minister Imran Khan's party won the highest number of parliamentary seats, uh, though not an outright majority. Uh, they may still not be able to form government. Uh, the election was marred by allegations of election day interference. Um, Khan's party has cited uh, discrepancies, major ones in polling station results versus constituency level results. Uh, there were also unexplained delays in vote counting uh, the night of the election and then continuing for several days. Uh, the final results took days to come out when they were due um, constitutionally by that night. Um, and there is also the fact that some candidates lost uh, major vote leads that had been reported on election night by the next morning. Um, the Free and Fair Election Network, uh, a body that was observing the elections, noted that they were not allowed to observe result tabulation in about half of the electoral constituencies. Nevertheless, uh, the result as it stands was stunning in an election season that had been deemed a foregone conclusion for former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's party that had been expected to emerge the winner. And that had been marked by a state crackdown on um, former Prime Minister Imran Khan's party. Uh, and the foregone conclusion um, uh, that, that it was actually PMLN, uh, Nawaz Sharif's party that would win, um, was because the scales had been tipped that way. Uh, Imran Khan had been incarcerated, uh, sentenced in three different cases just the week prior to the election. Um, his party had all but been dismantled in the last year. The entire senior leadership had been pressured to quit politics. Um, and perhaps most significantly and most importantly for election day, the party had been stripped of its electoral symbol, the bat, um, which meant that it was actually not on the ballot. Both the name of the party and the party symbol were not on the ballot. Its candidates had to run as independents. Uh, and of course, in, a, in the um, uh, run up to the election, they had not been allowed to campaign openly and had seen, had seen a bit of a media blackout. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, uh, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif returned from um, exile last October. Uh, he had the way cleared for him uh, to run for election had the cases against him overturned. Um, and of course, all of this is uh, very familiar to Pakistanis, part of the military's usual playbook to control uh, politics, par for the course in Pakistan, where those who fall out with the establishment um, feel the weight of the state's machinery work against them, and those who are in favor feel it work for them. Of course, just uh, uh, over five years ago in the 2018 election, the scales had been tipped uh, in Imran Khan's favor, and, and he won that election, and it had been tipped against Sharif. Um, so without further ado, here to discuss all this, we are, as I said, joined by an excellent panel. Um, uh, two of our panelists are joining us from Pakistan. Um, uh, Ahmed Bilal Mehboob is the president of PILDAT, the Pakistan Institute of Legislative Development and Transparency. Um, he is joining us from Lahore today. Um, Amber Rahim Shamsi is the director for excellence, director for the Center for Excellence in Journalism uh, at IBA, the Institute of Business Administration, part of Karachi University. Um, she is joining us from Karachi, if I am not mistaken. Um, and Michael Kugelman uh, is the director of the South Asia Institute at the Wilson Center. He uh, uh, is joining us from the area, so we're both based uh, in Washington. Uh, a reminder to the audience as we go through 
uh, this discussion, please submit questions to us via Twitter using hashtag Pakistan elections or by me emailing events at brookings.edu. Um, and I'll, I'll send a reminder again, we'll weave in audience questions at the end. Uh, so for the, without further ado, I'll get started. Um, I will engage the panelists for about um, uh, 35 minutes or so, uh, and, uh, and then we'll weave in audience questions at the end. Um, so let's start off with a discussion on the election itself. I, I would just uh, like to actually get very brief reactions, if I could, from each of the panelists, including uh, for you, Amber and, and Bilal, if you could tell us a little bit about the mood on the ground in your in the respective cities you're in, because you can actually give us that perspective. Um, and, and if you uh, can can comment on sort of the, the reaction, your reaction to the results, um, you can also comment on sort of the, the conduct of um, uh, polling day, you know, election day. Uh, you can uh, comment on the days leading up to the polls um, and, and what you've learned um, uh, as an initial reaction. Um, and uh, I will start off uh, with Bilal, then Amber, then Michael. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I feel very honored to be in this August company and uh, uh, with Brookings uh, on a subject uh, as interesting and as timely as Pakistani elections. Uh, I begin by recognizing that uh, for the first time in Pakistan's history of elections, a political party has emerged uh, successful, at least in securing the highest number of seats in the National Assembly, uh, which has been forcibly removed from the uh, power in the past. This has never happened. Uh, once a party is removed, uh, then that party doesn't return to power, at least in the most subsequent election. So PTI uh, has been able to emerge as the largest political party uh, in Pakistani National Assembly, uh, this is something which has been a unique feature of this uh, election. Uh, I, 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 I wish to share uh, the disappointment uh, which, Madhya, you have just mentioned about the delay in election results. I think in this election, if there was one major disappointment, that was the delay in announcing the result of the election which really created a lot of doubts about the integrity of the election. Uh, since by law, the results were supposed to be announced by 2 a.m. early in the morning next day. Uh, and even if there were some instances where it could not be possible, they must be announced by the next day by 10 in the morning. But unfortunately, not a single constituency out of 859 constituencies result was announced by 2 a.m. And 10 a.m. next morning, uh, only 30 uh, National Assembly constituencies results were announced uh, around 11 in the morning. So that was a uh, not only a violation of the law, that was great disappointment. And I think people were justified in doubting that why this delay has taken place. And whatever little justification we have heard, about that delay has not been very, uh, very convincing. So that is one feature of this election. But I must also remind you that election in Pakistan uh, had almost always been very contentious. Uh, almost every time one party or the other, which has not won the election, would consider elections uh, rigged and would be raising uh, hue and cry. And there had been a huge agitation in 2000 after 2013 election which led to a uh, uh, to a sitting sit in in Islamabad which paralyzed the capital paralyzed the country uh, for, for for quite a long time uh, after the 2013 election and which eventually led to the premature removal of the Nawaz Sharif government in 2017 so i think uh, this time it is again a very contentious election uh, there are times when, despite the contentious elections, government are formed and uh, government is able to move on, at least for two, three years, uh, and make decisions 
which are needed to be made. But uh, this time, we will see whether this will be possible. Uh, apparently, PTI seems to be in a combative mood. They have appointed uh, a leader of the opposition, which most likely will be the position, who is a very uh, aggressive uh, uh, person and who had been criticizing uh, the opponents in very strong terms. So it seems that there is going to be uh, conflict on the assembly floor and outside. And we hope that despite that, country is able to move on and country is able to uh, solve some of the critical issues like economy, which we are facing right now. Before I conclude, a couple of points I want to just, data points I want to draw your attention to, that uh, voter turnout, despite the fact there was a, there were two kind of uh, uh, forecasts that either it will be, people will come out in huge numbers, it will be a tsunami of voters, our people will be will be disappointed and they will not come out to vote. So voter turnout will be very low. In fact, uh, reality is somewhere between the two. We have uh, five percentage point lower voter turnout than we had in 2018. Uh, it is about 47 percentage percent uh, voter turnout. Second thing is that the party share in the National Assembly votes is almost the same as it was uh, in 2018 election for PMLN and for PTI. So that remains the same. And third point and last point I want to mention is that very surprisingly and almost prophetically, public opinion poll, which was announced on 1st January, its results are matching exactly with the result of this election. Uh, I don't know how did it happen. It very rarely happens, but the, vote, but the uh, number of votes Percentage of votes secured by both PMLN and PTI and People's Party are exactly the same as we have seen in this election. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, um, Amber. If I can, if I can turn to you before that, I should just mention uh, for for those who who might not be familiar at this point, it seems um, uh, that the. PDM, the Pakistan Democratic Movement Coalition uh, that is formed of uh, uh, the PMLN, Nawaz Sharif's party, and the PPP, uh, which is the, the party of the, the Bhuttos, the two dynastic parties, plus uh, several others that had uh, taken over after uh, Khan's ouster uh, in uh, April 2022 uh, for 16 months uh, until a caretaker government uh, took over in August uh, 2023. That seems likely to emerge victorious, uh, and and part of the reason there, of course, is um, that uh, uh, Khan's party won a plurality, uh, but not a, a majority, and would have needed to um, uh, uh, go into a coalition um, with uh, one of those parties, uh, uh, or uh, you know have enough uh, votes. Uh, somehow to to gain a majority, uh, and and that uh, is sort of uh, where we're where we're going. But government has not yet been formed. Uh, Amber, yeah, thank you, thank you so much, and and uh, really uh, honored to be among such amazing panelists as well. So I'm in Karachi. So uh, my I'm going to start with the mood in Karachi and what I saw on election day when I spoke to multiple people um, and as well as reporters. Um, because I was at a, as a at a TV channel and a media organization when uh, elections were uh, post after the election results, we were waiting for them. So first of all, um, in 2024, there was a, a great sense of deja vu because I remember the 2018 elections and I was um, on, on working at a TV channel at that time and we were waiting for results which suddenly stopped uh, and there was a massive slowdown uh, and many results uh, came in, you know, two days later, particularly Karachi at that time. And I felt a real, a real sense of deja vu. It was like, well, here we are again. There's another election where it's four o'clock in the morning and we don't know really what's happening. So uh, that points to the information gap, which, um, you know, I'll talk about a little later, but that that's pretty key. Um, but second of all, I think uh, the Pakistan Tariq Insaf, despite the many challenges and the oppression that they faced uh, and the court cases against the party, as decisions that went against them, as well as as uh, Imran Khan, a week before the election, um, uh, show demonstrated creativity and a lot of resistance uh, and resilience, and and you saw that in the vote. 
Um, I would say that the vote, even though the turnout was low, and, and here a lot of myths were busted as well. The myth was uh, in Pakistan, the popular myth was that if turnout is high, it would benefit the Pakistan Tariqa and Saf. Uh, the turnout, as uh, Ahmed Bilal Saab as, as pointed out, it was lower. In fact, uh, the lowest, I believe, was in KP, um, lower than normal. Punjab also, you saw um, uh, the turnout being relatively lower as well. Um, so that myth was busted. Um, and I think that another myth that was busted was that if Pakistan, Tariq and Saf, which lost its symbols. So it's important to remember why symbols are important in a country like Pakistan, because people associate a picture um, with a, a political party. They will go and vote for them. Uh, the Pakistan, Tariq and Saf, given that Imran Khan was a cricketer uh, and his, his uh, claim to fame as well was the bat forever. Easy to see, easy to stamp. Um, and I think among the many cases against the Pakistan Tariq and Saf, and those are, for instance, uh, attacks on military installations on 9th May 2023, um, the, uh, uh, you know, Tosha Khanna uh, case as well against him, foreign funding case against the party. I think the symbols case in which uh, the uh, election commission and uh, the court uh, ruled that the Pakistan Tariq and Saf had not conducted intra-party elections according to their own constitution and therefore lost their symbol. I think that was probably um, very, very damaging. But I think that Tariq and Saf, through its creativity, its use of technology, um, um, you know, its website was banned. It used bots and messenger services uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, their, their supporters and their voters knew which candidate had which symbol because there were you know, thousands of different candidates and, and different symbols. Uh, second, third tier leadership, because many of the party, um, senior party leadership had left the party, joined other parties, uh, or had quit or retired from politics. Um, and under, uh, you know, this was probably, um, as as we know, that this, in, this decision uh, was not organic. So I think um, uh, the myth, that's a couple of myths that were broken. Um, in terms of, um, um, I would say, in terms of winners and losers, I would actually say that the loser, by and large, for me, uh, is actually um, all political parties, including Pakistan Tehreek and Saab, because while they do have the majority seats uh, in, they don't have for, to make uh, to form the sort of federal federal government, they can't because they don't have a symbol and they don't have the, you know, they're not a, considered to be a parliamentary party. Um, but their voters are definitely winners. There's a lot of anger and sympathy. Uh, in Karachi, uh, there were long queues. Um, people were uh, who had also been disillusioned by the Pakistan Tehreek and Saf uh, after its performance in government uh, saw the kind of sort of uh, victimization that it was facing. Uh, and and those three court cases, the last the week before, they were really. I think that's that. I think it, it might have been a message, obviously, to voters. But the message that the voters read was, well, we are angry. We uh, want to demonstrate through our vote that uh, this is not acceptable. Uh, so there was a lot of sympathy. There was a lot of anger. Um, and so they went out to vote. There were long queues in Karachi. There's one constituency in Karachi, Karachi South, I believe, uh, that had a 23% uh, turnout. But you also had, uh, there's lots of polling stations uh, in which, um, uh, voting didn't open until three o'clock. The polling uh, staff didn't come in until three o'clock. So there's obviously, it wasn't just that the internet was was shut down. There were constituencies where there was deliberate um, management of how many people will come out to vote. Um, I think all political parties in many ways are losers, um, to be honest, as I pointed out, Pakistan Tariq and Saf, and I gave my reason why. But I think also the um, Pakistan Muslim Nawaz in particular is probably the biggest loser in this particular election um, because um, the expectation was that um, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz's biggest competitor, obviously Punjab being where you would get the most votes, is the Pakistan Tariq Insaf. Given that, that all that was happening to the Pakistan Tariq Insaf, uh, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz was betting on, on a bigger, clear victory. And Nawaz Shri's return, um, you know, fourth time prime minister, you know, we had ads just the day before. They they placed front page ads in all the newspapers, uh, major newspapers announcing uh, uh, Nawaz Sharif as the next prime minister. Um, and um, there was a lot of criticism on the newspapers as well as obviously the party itself, which obviously spent a lot of money in in uh, legacy media that obviously that did, wasn't effective, didn't work. So the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz benefited from the sense that uh, the military establishment supported them. Um, 
in the sense that, you know, um, in, in terms of the ease of campaigning. But ultimately, that backfired and backfired by very badly because people were very, very angry. Um, so the Pakistan People's Party, um, while I think at this, this point in time, what we see uh, is there's going to be a, a minority government in which the Pakistan People's Party will support the candidature of Shabazz Sharif as next prime minister, which is why we're thinking of this as PDM too. But it is going to be a minority government in the sense that because Pakistan People's Party will not be a part of the cabinet, um, decision making will be on a case to case basis, whether it's legislation, uh, which is very key, obviously. Um, the Pakistan People's Party has it been, it, it, it was looking, Bilabal Bhutto, given that he was trying to capture the anti Nawaz vote, the PTI vote. I, I do think that his, uh, the um, percentage win in, in Punjab demonstrates that Bilabal didn't make the inroads into Punjab that he was, he was hoping for. They're winners in Sindh and, and very clearly. In fact, the biggest margin of victories uh, are in Sindh, for instance, and KP with PTI. Um, the closest contests were obviously um, in Punjab, but um, uh, while they have, have sinned and very clearly have sinned, they weren't able to successfully uh, get uh, Punjab. However, the advantage, obviously, that's the election lo loss, I think. But with the with Bilawal being young uh, and and their insistence uh, on keeping away from cabinet uh, as a you know in, in terms of minority government means that Bilawal is obviously playing the long game. Uh, so we'll see how that turns out. Um, I'm just going to end this with the fact that at the moment, um, there, there, uh, this is a, obviously a period victory. It was a brief moment of euphoria when those results did come out. And the Pakistan Derikans have got a lot of votes. But it means that we had this period of instability where there's no clear um, who is going to be in government and then how long will it survive. So just before the election, uh, the big question in Pakistan was, Will there be elections? Uh, who is going to be in government? Who will be prime minister? And now, at this point in time, the conversation, the debate is, well, how long will this government last? Uh, because any government that comes into power does have to make those tough, tough policy decisions. Um, at the same time, it is insecure. And it is also dependent on the military because it is a weak government uh, in order to survive, really. Um, it's got a very angry Pakistan that he gains off who are happy to take the streets and have who obviously can claim moral victory as well, given what the results were, uh, and now and, and are asking for um, Imran Khan to be released, uh, who are asking for you know elections to be held again, uh, free and fair elections. Uh, they've got a Pakistan People's Party who are playing the long game um, uh, and and are looking to at least maintain some distance from uh, a government that there is this weak. Um, so yes, I think we're ending. We we started the elections uh, on on a note of uncertainty, and the elections are continuing on this note of uncertainty. Great, uh, thanks, Amber. And you know, uh, both of you have touched upon points uh, that I'm sure uh, we'll will expand on. Uh, Michael, for from for you, you know, your your quick result um, reaction to the results, um, and. Uh, uh, I, I would like if you could also to um, uh, talk a little bit about the the world's reaction, uh, the the U.S. reaction uh, to the results, and you know the State Department and Congress have issued statements. Uh, members of Congress have issued statements. I should say, um, if you, if you can sort of mention that, um, and if you want to also uh, tie into that discussion, sort of um, some threads that Umber has already uh, started talking about. What does this mean uh, for Pakistan, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking ahead, at least in the short to medium term? And then we will talk about the longer term as well. Uh, thanks, uh, Madiha. It's uh, great to be a part of this um, this discussion, especially with uh, all these other panelists. Uh, so, yeah, very briefly, um, you know, two main uh, takeaways that come to mind for me in looking over the the conduct of the election and also the lead up to it. Um, you know, as as you had laid out yourself in your introduction, uh, it's very clear that the the electoral playing field was not uh, level; it was tilted against PTI. That was very clear. The tactics deployed against PTI were not new, but uh, my sense is the intent with which those tactics were deployed was quite striking. And I think it was one of the more repressive pre-election crackdowns in recent memory uh, in, in Pakistan. Second, um, you know, there's a silver lining, I think, at play here. Um, there was, it was a relatively, and I emphasize the word relatively, a relatively peaceful election. There was violence. 
there was deadly violence, uh, tragically. But if you look at um, what played out in 2018 and especially 2013, uh, you did not have as much political violence. You did not have as much terrorist violence as you did in the two uh, pardon, the two prior elections. Pardon me. So that's a silver lining for us uh, here. In terms of uh, key takeaways from the election itself, three, and I'll be very brief. Um, the nature of the election campaign, it was a short campaign because for a while it wasn't clear when and if the election was going to happen. But once it became clear it was happening, you had a brief campaign. And I would describe um, what I saw on, on many levels, um, a, a truly 21st century campaign that reflected uh, 21st century realities in Pakistan, you know, heavy use of social media, including the use of AI. Uh, the, you know, the you had the deployment of tools that are embraced by youth in Pakistan. And of course, that is the dominant demographic. But you know, this is essentially I'm describing the PTI campaign above all else, above of all others here. Um, the the campaigns waged the by the PMLN were quite frankly struck me as a bit more subdued. Nawaz Sharif wasn't really that visible in the campaign trail. Uh, PPP I think had a, a very robust active campaign, but was fairly traditional. But you know, it was really PTI that was stepping out, deploying these these mod 21st century technologies, and I think this helps explain why PTI did so well. Another thing that stands out about the election itself is, quite frankly, the, the nature of the rigging allegations. You know, unfortunately, we know that this is not the first time that there have been allegations of rigging and vote tampering in an election. But this time we have um, primary sources at play. Uh, you know, we have these these official documents, um, you know, P45s, as they're as they're described, which appear to show uh, or at least according to the view of, of PTI supporters and many independent observers as well, show a clear uh, disparity um, or contrast in terms of you know, what was tabulated at polling stations versus what the actual results were, showing that in a number of cases you had different candidates winning as, as um, said, but stated by the official results compared to what was seen in these, um, these official, these P45 documents that reported the final tallies from each polling station. That's pretty significant. Um, final point on, on takeaways, this has already been stated. I mean, we know that PTI did, did very well. It, it overcame this traditional military dominance over electoral politics. Usually the party that the military does not want to come to power does not do that well electorally. And of course, PTI did do quite well. And I think that we can contrast this with how Pakistanis in the past have successfully resisted and pushed back against uh, the military's political dominance and power more broadly. So if you look at the lawyers movement some years ago, when you had this uh, civil society campaign uh, in favor of democracy and against military rule, uh, if you look at something like, you know, very different, these these um, camp these more grassroots civil society campaigns, these uh, peasants and farmers in, uh, in Punjab that have pushed back against military farms. There's a lot of examples, but until now, it's been very rare to have the military's um, heavy influence, if not outright dominance over electoral politics be countered in the way that PTI did, given that you know you had nearly 100 PTI sponsored independents win seats. I think that, and this gets to your question about, you know, what does this mean for Pakistan uh, looking forward into the, the short to medium term? I think that what I've just described can be seen as encouraging for, for democracy and that we have seen the electorate overcome military sponsored pre-election environment shaping. But I would caveat that by saying that we, I, I'm not suggesting that PTI itself should be seen as a vehicle for consolidating uh, democracy in Pakistan. I think we have to be very honest. It is a party that has always taken a very confrontational position to politics and to party politics. It has tended to be unwilling to compromise, including when it was in power for a few years. Its own record when in government was not particularly strong uh, based on democratic indicators. Uh, you know, there were major crackdowns on dissent back then. And Khan himself, in my view, is not against a strong military role in politics. He clearly has a beef against the current army leadership. His criticism of the military has often been very personal, targeting specific leaders, but not necessarily as much targeting the institution itself. So when I say that we should be optimistic for, a bit optimistic for the future of democracy in Pakistan, I say that because you know, in, in the context of this being rooted in how the electorate, not any particular party, though it happens to be the PTI this case, defied the military's control over electoral politics. Very brief to your question about global reactions. 
Um, it is striking the way in which Western capitals, including the U.S., re reacted, including calling for investigations of voting irregularities, just because I would say that Western capitals have been fairly subdued in their public messaging about uh, Pakistan's situation on the whole since Khan's ouster, particularly in terms of concerning signs uh, for uh, for democracy. But here, I think one has to go back to what I had said um, earlier, that, um, you know, there appear to be very clear indications of rigging, uh, because you have primary sources in this case, you have formal, actual specific documents, which was not the case previously. And perhaps that you have certain governments, including the US government that feel a need to not directly refer to that, but it may make them more inclined to push for uh, push for investigations. Bottom line, and I'll, I'll close here, you know, this is an old story, you know, you, we, we've all, well, many of us have written about this. Western governments, um, uh, certainly they support democracy in Pakistan, but they have always been very content to engage with the military leadership of the day, including when you have civilian rule, which has been the case in Pakistan for the last 15 years. So in that sense that, yes, there may be a bit of concern, a bit of concern in Western capitals about some of these indications of irregularities and rigging and all. But in the, in the, at the end of the day, as these government's statements indicated, they will be willing to work with whatever government comes out there. Um, but even more important than that, the army, you know, is, is there no matter what. And I think that there will be the continue to be that comfort level in engaging with with the uh, with the military leadership. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Michael. Uh, lots of really important points brought up here, and I'd just like to underline uh, uh, some of them. Um, one is that the, the discrepancy between polling station level results and constituency level results uh, has, as Michael said, been put out in the open. Um, and part of that, again, is the use of technology, you know, uploading these on social media so people can actually see them, sort of visually see irregularities, when in the past it's just been sort of indications uh, or, or sorry, accusations of irreg irregularities. Um, uh, two, um, uh, I should note that multiple parties have been have been noting irregularities, not just uh, uh, PTI, which is which is uh, significant. Um, the, the 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 sort of second larger point I'd like to make uh, is uh, the the fact that you know it's Pakistan's youth, the the middle classes, um, and that sort of support uh, PTI. Um, that's a large you know that's a large demographic and that's a growing demographic. So that has implications for the future of Pakistan's politics because Pakistan's youth uh, is its is its largest uh, 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 demographic. Um, and uh, the the sort of the third uh, large point I'd like to underline, you know, Umber's point about uncertainty ahead. Um, this will be a cause uh, for concern uh, for, uh, uh, you know, obviously those who uh, are, are watching Pakistan, um, especially when it comes to Pakistan's economy, because the uncertainty had caused um, uh, or had exacerbated uh, in many ways Pakistan's economic crisis where it veered on the brink of default last year. And of course, um, Pakistan has an IMF program that is um, going to run out uh, that ends in March. Uh, so this new incoming government it will have to um, uh, make some big economic decisions, including um, uh, embarking on a new program with the IMF. There are about $24 billion uh, in debt uh, due uh, by June this year, uh, $90 billion due in uh, three years. Um, these are not numbers that can be um, uh, dealt with with a bailout here or a bailout there or even an IMF program. Um, so there needs to be restructuring uh, and, and some big decisions made. Um, and we'll get into whether, uh, in, in sort of in this next round, I would like to get into, you know, uh, discussion on the next government, uh, if it is what we expect it will be, um, you know, how can it ta tackle Pakistan's major economic and security challenges, this, uh, this resurgent and growing threat from uh, the Pakistan Taliban, uh, threat from ISIS. Um, and, and Michael, uh, one point that you brought out about the electorate uh, being the winner here, what does that tell us about how civil military relations are going to be in the in the now medium to longer term? So now if we could also just sort of look 
in a bit of a longer horizon, that would be useful. So, so lots of uh, things uh, brought up here. Um, but um, if if we can, in this sort of next round, talk about the next government, uh, its ability to deal with the economic and security challenges uh, that Pakistan has, um, and and then you know what do we expect for civil military relations? I have to say that PDM 1.0. Uh, saw a real backsliding uh, in terms of civil military relations, which were already uh, problematic uh, at the beginning. But um, in uh, at the end of the, the the PDM's term, of course, we saw uh, the Army Amendment Act uh, of 2023, um, and and we did see unprecedented power being uh, handed over uh, to the military. Do we see more of that uh, in the uh, in the future if we have a PDM 2.0 government, as we all expect? Um, so just some questions. Amber, I'm going to start off with you, then we'll go to Emma, uh, then Michael, and then we'll do one more round after. All right, um, before I address the civil military question, I, I do want to just very quickly touch upon a, a point that Michael had made about the forms, the initial forms that candidates get um, and the way that the Pakistan Tariq Insaf has obviously put a lot of these forms on a website uh, for people to see as evidence of rigging. But I want to point out that... Um, and this was uh, something that I uh, spoke about when I spoke earlier as well, which is about both information manipulation and management. So the internet being shut down made it very difficult for voters to obviously find their constituents, uh, their polling stations. Um, it made it very difficult for people to get, uh, for um, um, uh, political parties to communicate with their polling agents. But they found there were workarounds. Even reporters had a lot of trouble. I spoke to some reporters as well um, who were observing the election uh, and wanted to send results back as quickly as possible. Um, and they had trouble with it. So this was obviously a state-led um, information management. And part of that was obviously not enough. Uh, uh, you know, Imran Khan was banned his speeches, you couldn't see them. Uh, and the Pakistan that he can self used AI, virtual rallies and all of that uh, in order to cover that gap up. But we also saw obviously massive information manipulation on the part of political parties. And I run uh, I Verify Pakistan, which is a fact checking organization, especially for the elections. Uh, and uh, we were, my, my team was working, uh, just started working in December, tracking all the uh, disinformation and misinformation. And just a week before the election and, and it continues, uh, th those numbers of how much they were monitoring um, absolutely uh, doubled and tripled. Uh, and it's become very hard to cope up with it. And I want to link that to the forms as well, because um, one of the tools and tactics of information manipulation is that you flood um, uh, you flood social media or media with so much information that it's hard to fact check it. And um, a lot of independent uh, journalists have also found that while there is obviously truth um, to the Pakistan Tariq Insaf claim of rigging in many cases and constituents, constituencies, and how do we track that as journalists? How do we assess that? Uh, those delays mean that there's obviously, it creates doubt. Um, if uh, polling agents aren't allowed and uh, to observe the counting process, that creates doubt. Um, that means that there's possibly some rigging. If reporters aren't allowed as well, or they don't get those, uh, they're not able to get those results quickly by law, which they're supposed to, um, you know, that creates doubt as well. And there are discrepancies between obviously uh, the count at the each polling station and then the uh, Form 47, as it's called, which is the provisional result that you see, which is a collection consolidated result of um, all the polling stations within one constituencies. So there are obviously clearly discrepancies and, and many parties, as you pointed out, Madiha, have, um, have but, but the degree of it is something that we have to wait until because there's so much information manipulation that includes, includes use of AI that includes uh, discrediting political parties and journalists who are critical, uh, who have been raising questions, or even uh, whether it's against one party or for one party. Uh, so there's massive information manipulation uh, and disinformation that's that's happened and continues to happen because there are information gaps, because there's so much information management uh, by the state, uh, and because this is such a contentious, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, election. So I want to sort of close on that. And in terms of the civil military, I think the really key here is the uh, SIFC, a um, um, uh, which is uh, the uh, a committee that's uh, the, that's been formed in order to get investment into Pakistan, and that's definitely a very military-led initiative uh, that um, came into was birthed uh, when PDM one was in power and legislated on, and that's key in terms of. Um, investment, if there's political certainty, there's obviously going to be more investment and obviously how the military is able uh, to manage uh, the economic situation as well. Um, 
And if you have, uh, and, and the control of resources, there's been so many complaints over the years about uh, resources from the center being going into the provinces. That's been a key uh, sort of uh, sticking point for the military as well. Uh, and the SIFC could perhaps be one way in which the military would be able to sort of cover that gap as well. So I think... Uh, uh, if, if there were plans that uh, the SIFC would flourish, there would be investment uh, and resource security for the military, I, you know, uh, this kind of um, uh, contentious transfer of power, which is what many of us expected it to be, uh, is not going to help. And, and therefore, obviously, as I pointed out earlier as well, and I'm going to close this, the weaker civilian government is in terms of seats, uh, you know, the harder it is to actually assert civilian authority. Great. Um, uh, Bilal, I think uh, I'll turn to you in terms of your views on um, the next government, um, its stability, uh, what we can expect for civil military relations in the the sort of the short to medium term, but also the, the longer term, its uh, ability to address economic and security challenges that Pakistan faces. Thank you. Uh, but very briefly, I want to also uh, underline the point which Amber made regarding the uh, possibility of many of these documents which have been put up on internet to be not correct ones. There could be fake documents. This needs to be verified and proper forum will have to be decided uh, whether this uh, documents are correct or not. Uh, coming to uh, uh, the next government, uh, I think this uh, kind of result, which I pointed out is a unique kind of result, where a party which was ousted by force has come back to become the largest political party. I think that uh, provides an opportunity uh, for, for both military and civil to reconsider. I think the futility of uh, what uh, military did and the result has probably shown that should be should be considered as a uh, something which will prompt them to start rethinking about the civil military relations and uh, not to allow the old pattern of civil military relations to continue so i think this should provide them a an opportunity to reconsider that in that sense but on the other hand uh, you mentioned about the economy uh, economy is the major issue which Pakistan and any future government of Pakistan will be facing. And if there is no stability in the country, and if the government is not allowed to function, which, I, which there is a possibility that there is uh, agitation and there is protests on the streets about uh, uh, the supposedly the rigging of the elections or whatever it is, uh, then it means that the uh, government, whichever is formed, will not be able to be stable and will not be able to take hard decisions and will not be able to address the major issues of economy. If that is the case, in that case, uh, uh, I I don't, uh, I mean, it, it pains me a lot to say that, but I don't see the future or prospects of democracy very bright in the future. Because uh, uh, if uh, the economy is not addressed, which means Pakistan would be moving towards a default situation once again, then uh, many people would be thinking that better than democracy uh, take a situation where things for, uh, with country have stable uh, governance and can address the issues of uh, economy in a much uh, uh, stable manner. So I think in that sense, uh, civil military relations may take a direction in the opposite turn, uh, which otherwise if there's a very little hope, but I just want to highlight that if it is somehow possible for PTI to somehow start talking to other two parties, because it can only form a government, uh, be part of a government if it is talking to them. And he has openly said that he won't talk to them. But if in the meantime, if he is convinced that he should be talking to them, that can probably uh, be a major game changer. And then we can move, move towards a more stability while preserving democracy. Otherwise, I think I see clear threats to democracy in the days to come while we start addressing our economic issues. 
Right. Um, in some ways, because the situation continues to be unstable, you know, an instability that basically started two years ago, um, and this election has done. Uh, uh, while I think there is there is there is hope that uh, the Pakistani voter, uh, you know, brought to the country, um, the the way the results have have shaken out, um, uh, it will feel. Uh, to the Pakistani voter, uh, you know, the next government will feel like a disappointment. And so uh, uncertainty is likely to continue. Uh, and I think uh, that instability doesn't bode well, uh, as you said, um, for for civil military relations or for the, the next government. Um, uh, Michael, I'll, I'll turn to you. Um, if you could also, you know, uh, uh, talk a little bit about in terms of what to expect from the new government, what do we expect from its foreign policy? If it is indeed PDM 2.0, is it just going to be a repeat of uh, the 16 months that we saw PDM 1.0, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, in terms of its relationship with other countries or with a ostensibly a five-year time horizon. We don't know whether any government will last that long in Pakistan, of course, uh, but but ostensibly that time horizon. Might we expect some changes when it comes to relations with India, relations with the US, relations with China? Uh, thanks, Medea. So just to say, I agree with what the other panelists said about the need to be careful uh, in examining these uh, P45s. Indeed, misinformation is rife. And I, I do know for a fact uh, as well, I think I'm agreeing with others that there have been fake P45 put up. There have been fake websites uh, that have in, uh, wrong documents. It's important for this all to get out there in the public domain as well. Um, so this, um, I, I, as others have said, this we're likely to see a large and unruly new coalition with many parties, including the two biggest ones in it, that don't get along. Um, so that suggests that it'll be, uh, it'll be weak and susceptible to the army's influence. Um, and this coupled with the fact that the likely leading party in the coalition, the PMLN, is not wildly popular and has angered the public for failing to stabilize the economy, that suggests that it may struggle to find the political space to make politically risky moves like structural uh, reforms. To your question about foreign affairs, I, I anticipate continuity with the previous PDM government. Uh, it will look to keep relations with, with China uh, on track. Beijing, I think, has a comfort level, a strong comfort level with the PMLN just because they work very closely on the implementation of, uh, of CPEC. Uh, I think that outreach to the Arab Gulf states will clearly be a key priority, uh, especially because you know we know that the Sharif brothers, including Shabazz, the likely prime minister, have you know, close personal ties to, uh, to the Gulf states. I think we'll see this next coalition push for, for friendly ties with the West, just like previously. Um, and I think that we will see it try to manage current relations with, uh, with neighbors so that they don't get worse. I mean, we know that uh, you know, Pakistan's relations with Afghanistan and Iran have taken a turn for the worse in recent months. With India, they've remained uh, fairly stable, but they're always, there's always going to be the risk of worse tensions. And, you know, I would say here that Pakistan, it may be isolated regionally, but it is not isolated globally, uh, contrary to what many critics of Pakistan indicate. Um, you know, it has close partnerships with some really powerful global players. Um, so I think that the new government will want to keep things that way, manage tensions with neighbors, but and ensure relations with its global partners remain in place. On civil military relations, if if Shabazz does become the next prime minister, you know he. My sense is that he is viewed as a as a, an evergreen favorite son uh, of the military. Unlike his brother, where there's been uh, you know, back and forth, you know, the relationship is blown hot and cold. So that'll help civil military relations. I think that initially there will be a honeymoon period, as there typically is. Uh, when you have a new government coming in, and there's several areas where I anticipate the civilians and the military converging. They'll both agree on the need to focus on economic recovery. Um, I suspect they'll both agree on the need to negotiate a new deal with the IMF and indeed to work on the SIFC um, arrangement. Um, I imagine they'll both agree on the need to tackle terrorism threats, on the need to work for workable, focus on workable relations with the West, mainly for economic reasons. Um, and I suspect that Shabazz would take a tougher line on India than Nawaz would. Um, you know, he's someone that signaled a desire to try to look into outreach to India. 
and the fact that Shabazz would likely take a harder line, I think, would 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 be in line with with the, the military's position. Finally, I think they would both agree. The civilians and military would both agree on the need to to manage the PTI challenge, to put it mildly. But you know, there could be a, there if we follow past president here. That honeymoon probably wouldn't last long. Uh, you know, how far to go on economic reform would be a key issue that could become a tension point. My sense is that the army really wants to take the reform process further, capitalizing on what was started during the caretaker era where you had some privatization progress with PIA, the, the state-run airliner. Um, there are strong business lobbies in the PMLN that may support the idea of structural reform as well, but PMLN will worry about the political implications. So it may resist really harsh steps on, on austerity. The Nawaz factor always looms large here. Um, you know, he's sparred with the military in the past. Even if he's not prime minister, he's not going to go away. He'll be very present, uh, so to speak. And how that could impact civil military relations is something to watch. I'll end with this, though. I think that this next government will likely face bigger threats to its survival from civil civil tensions than from civil military tensions. You know, PMLN and PPP have issues. We've seen that. There's many things they don't agree with. They don't get get along uh, on. And also, you know, the the other question here is the PTI situation. What might it do in the opposition? Will it put pressure on the government? Will it make life difficult for the government? Will there be street protests? How would the state respond to that? How the PTI reacts, I think, could have a, a significant implications for the, the longevity of this next government for reasons not necessarily related to civil military uh, issues. Great. Well, we, we have, you know, just over five minutes. So um, uh, I want to highlight one point uh, and then ask a couple of questions to our panelists. We had audience questions come in, but we've been uh, we've already addressed uh, quite a few of them. Um, so, so thank you to those who, who sent in questions. Um, the point about, you know, uh, the use of technology of AI and of misinformation in this election, this is something, of course, that we're, we're seeing globally in what is an uh, is a huge election year uh, around the world. Uh, by some reports, 83 elections uh, happening uh, this year uh, around the world and um, uh, about half of the world's population voting. Uh, so Pakistan, of course, the fifth largest country in the world, uh, and this is a very significant election uh, for the country, but we're seeing some of those uh, same, obviously, uh, tools uh, used in both positive, a positive sense uh, and uh, can be used in the sense of misinformation. Um, uh, on PDM 2.0, uh, you know, Umber brought out the point that PPP has said that they will not be in the cabinet. That will make PDM 2.0 different from PDM 1.0 in the sense that PPP, of course, had taken charge of two very important ministries, both the climate change ministry, important in a year that Pakistan had floods, and uh, the uh, foreign ministry. And of course, we might see differences this time around. So I'm going to ask one final question to all the panelists and 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 go go through. Um, I'll start with you, Michael, then Bilal, then Umber for closing. Uh, and if you could keep your responses to about a minute each. We're in 2029. Pakistan is about to have its next election. What are we what are we seeing? You know, what do you expect? Where do you expect Pakistan to be uh, in five years? Let's say we convene this panel again uh, for a discussion. What do you think we'll be talking about? Michael. Unfortunately, I think we'll be talking about many of the same issues, uh, civil military issues, uh, economic concerns and all. I just don't think the next five years are go is going to see a, a Pakistan solving all of these longstanding issues. And I also think that we'll be talking about PTI. I don't think PTI will go away, uh, even though Khan may be in jail for a few years. Uh, you know, if there's a new army chief uh, in a few years from now, um, that could that could have an impact on Khan's relations with the military. Khan wants to come back to power and he must know that uh, he needs to figure out ways to reconcile with the military to an extent. So I think PTI, um, along with the other parties, will be a big part of the conversation in 2029 uh, as well. Bilal? Uh, yeah, what uh, Michael just said reminded me of uh, late Stephen Cohen when somebody asked, uh, in fact, in, he has narrated that in his book as well, that what could be the, uh, will the situation get worse? Our situation will get better in Pakistan. He said, I'm afraid that the situation will remain the same. 
it will not change. So apparently it looks like that. But as I alluded to earlier, I think uh, situation of economy is such that it may not be possible for things to continue as they used to continue in the past. So some drastic decisions will have to be taken, even if I hope that those drastic decisions are taken with democracy intact. Uh, otherwise, uh, my sense is that if there is disturbances on the street and there's agitation on the streets, then the democracy may have to take back seat and people may start addressing the issues of economy, although I'm not very hopeful that they can also handle economy better than what we do it in the under democracy. But uh, there will be serious threats uh, before 2029 comes uh, about uh, democratic setup and the elections. Uh, this is what my apprehension is. That's right. And, you know, with that $90 billion due in the next in the next few years, something fundamentally, I think, needs to change, obviously, in the next few years. But even in the in the longer run, you know, Pakistan has to embark on a path of growth and productivity. Uh, and, and no party, uh, I should note, um, has uh, made Pakistan emerge on, or, or, you know, get onto an alternate path during the times that they've been in power, nor do they have a serious plan for, for doing so, at least in my opinion. Um, Amr, um, on to you for that question. Ah, well, the more things change, the more they remain the same, right? I mean, that's a sense I get from uh, from get past turnout figures two words now gets lower and lower um and then there's a coup um i hope that doesn't happen what i do fear is that um uh, there might be more repression um and i spoke about disinformation uh and and either the PDM government or the Pakistan Tariq against South government have tried uh to actually legislate against it uh so there may be more um authoritarian governments or governments that want to control or manage information will actually tend towards uh, more control rather than giving control. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where will we be. Uh, usually it's, it's pretty much the same. I keep getting deja vu every five, six years. Right. Well, um, you know, it's certainly been uh, an excellent discussion. Um, uh, you know, what what followed a, a very interesting election. Uh, you know, I said uh, I, when the election was about to happen, either this is going to be the most boring or the, the most interesting election in Pakistan's recent history. And I would say that uh, most would agree that it certainly shaped out to be a very interesting uh, uh, election. Um, uh, and, and more to come because, uh, you know, the government still hasn't yet been formed. Uh, and uh, we will certainly be watching Pakistan here uh, at, at Brookings, uh, more events on, on uh, Pakistan. Um, so on behalf of uh, the Center for Middle East Policy and the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, thank you so much to our excellent panelists for joining us for this discussion today, uh, to our audience for tuning in uh, and for your questions. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.